Chapter 10. Beneficial Outcomes for Humanity in the Smart Technology Era. Part 1. It took nine chapters to lay a foundation of sense-making and better understanding of AI, its applications, its benefits, its risks, its limitations, its progress, and its likely future paths in the smart technology era. We are now ready to discuss beneficial outcomes for humanity and how we can democratize AI to help shape a beneficial, human-centric future. In this chapter, we specifically examine what it means to be human and living meaningful in the 21st century, but also get a better understanding of the problematic trajectory that our current civilization is on. I also share some ideas for reshaping our civilization for beneficial outcomes, as well as various potential outcomes for the future of civilization. This chapter is then concluded by zooming in on the beneficial outcomes for humanity and introducing a proposed massive transformative purpose for humanity and its associated smart goals that complement the United Nations 2030 vision and sustainable development goals. What does it mean to be human and living meaningful in the 21st century? To help think about beneficial outcomes for humanity and meaningful living in the 21st century and beyond, it is useful to frame and give context to the discussion by referencing Maslow's hierarchy of needs, which is a motivational theory in psychology that consists of basic needs, such as physiological needs, for example, air, food, water, warmth, shelter, sex, sleep, and rest, and safety needs, for example, security, stability, and safety, psychological needs, such as belongingness and love needs, for example, intimate relationships, friends, and work, and esteem needs, for example, prestige, achievement, mastery, and feeling of accomplishment, and self-fulfillment needs, such as self-actualization, for example, achieving one's full potential, including creative activities. Basic needs typically need to be met before psychological and self-fulfillment needs. This five-stage motivational model has since been extended to an eight-stage hierarchical model which adds cognitive needs, for example, knowledge and understanding, need for meaning and predictability, exploration and curiosity, and aesthetic needs, for example, appreciation and search for beauty, form and balance in between esteem and self-actualization needs and then adds an additional layer on top for transcendence needs. For example, values beyond the personal self that includes experiences that relates to nature, mystics, aesthetics, as well as services to others, religious faith and pursuit of science. During the same decade that Abraham Maslow proposed his theory of human motivation in the 1940s, Viktor Frankl published his book, Man's Search for Meaning, An Introduction to Logotherapy, which has proven to be a very influential book for people exploring the meaning of life. Viktor, who was a prisoner in a Nazi concentration camp during World War II, recorded his experiences and explained his psychotherapeutic method that helped him survive the concentration camp through identifying a positive purpose in life and then immersively visualizing that outcome. He conjectured that a prisoner's longevity was directly affected by how the future was imagined. His theory of logotherapy, logos is the Greek word which indicates meaning, discusses the meaning of human existence and man's search for that meaning. Victor sees meaning in one's life as a primary motivational force and something unique and specific to oneself. He sees an inherent tension in a human being between what a person has already accomplished and what one still aspires to achieve. Victor does not see life as a search for pleasure, but a search for meaning and identifies three sources for meaning, which includes caring for another person, love, doing something significant, work, and bravery and determination during hard times, courage. He states that love is the utmost and supreme goal to which anyone can strive for. We all know that we cannot control what happens to us in our lives, but we can control what we feel and do about what happens to us. This, in some sense, also ties in with the first part of the serenity prayer that says, God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, courage to change the things I can, and wisdom to know the difference. 
The key freedom that each one of us will always have is to choose our attitude and the way we respond in any specific situation and moment. Viktor Frankl sees that having the responsibility in answering for your own life as the essence of human existence and advises to live as if you were living already for the second time and as if you had acted the first time as wrongly as you are about to act now. He notes that as soon as suffering finds a meaning of a sacrifice, it stops being suffering. Also, one cannot be happy without a reason to be happy. If someone's meaning has been identified, it not only helps one to be happy, but also assists with dealing with suffering and hardship. A recent book, The Meaning of Life and the Great Philosophers, authored by some leading experts in the field, reveals how 35 of the greatest past philosophers have tried to answer the question of the meaning of life. It consolidates some of the history of philosophy's wealth of opinion on this subject by major philosophical figures such as Confucius, the Buddha, Socrates, Plato, Yang Zhu, Aristotle, Epicurus, Epictetus, Aquinas, Descartes, Spinoza, Kant, Schopenhauer, Kierkegaard, Marx, Nietzsche, Ortega, Wittgenstein, Heidegger, Sartre, Camus, and Rory. The Internet Encyclopedia of Philosophy is also an excellent peer-reviewed academic resource that provides a deep dive into a much larger pool of philosophical material that also covers aspects of the meaning of life. As the philosophical school of the 20th century in the United States and Great Britain was more focused on hardcore scientific rationalism and the nature of logic, concepts and language, the philosophical question of the meaning of life that science is not well equipped to answer was for the most part avoided. Kiran Setia, a professor in philosophy at MIT and author of Midlife Philosophical Guide, remarked in an article that philosophers should be keener to talk about the meaning of life. By examining all philosophies on the meaning of life, it looks like they can be classified into one of the four groups, supernatural meaning, objective meaning, subjective meaning, and life has no meaning. Furthermore, the philosophies of the West and East also seem to follow a pattern where people from the West emphasize the individual, whereas people from the East think more in terms of us, the community, or society. The earliest prehistoric schools of philosophy that also address the meaning of life includes natural pantheism that states that God is in everything and the meaning of life is in living in harmony with nature and all that there is, whilst theism proposes that God exists and that the meaning of life is to follow God's will. From approximately the 6th and the 5th century BC, determinism appeared, which accept that everything happens as a result of previously existing causes and is predetermined, including the meaning of life, which implies that we do not have free will. Whereas Taoism of Chinese origin offers a person a pain-free way of following the way and finding the meaning of life without the person knowing what it is until it is revealed when a person simply is. During the same time frame, Confucianism, by Chinese philosopher Confucius, teaches us to take care and fulfill our duties to others. Moism, by Chinese philosopher Mozi, advocates to love and take care of people impartially. And solipsism, by Greek philosopher Gorgias, expresses that as one can only be certain of the existence of one's mind, the meaning of life can only be known by one's mind and not by one's relation to other people. Around the 4th century BC, cynicism was introduced to provide people the possibility of happiness and freedom from suffering and see the meaning of life as having mental clarity and being self-sufficient and free from external influences, whereas hedonism presents people with a life of pursuing pleasure and avoiding suffering. Platonism was introduced in the 4th century BC by Greek philosopher Plato, who regarded the meaning of life as the pursuit of knowledge of abstractions. Plato references his teacher Socrates, who said that the unexamined life is not worth living, and makes the claims that we are all born with the knowledge inside us that just needs to be discovered. Legalism also emerged from China around the same time and declares that the meaning of life is to obtain practical skills that can be used by the state for society's benefit as people are selfish and cannot be trusted to behave in moral fashion. 
Epicureanism was during the same period introduced by the Greek philosopher Epicurus, who stated the meaning of life to be to achieve lasting mental pleasure, which leads to a state of calmness and freedom from fear. Around the 3rd century BC, Quietism was presented as the philosophy that has no answers to offer and regards the question of the meaning of life as meaningless. Whereas Aristotelianism, introduced by the Greek philosopher Aristotle, regards it sufficient to be a good person as virtue is the goal and we already know what is good. Stoicism also appeared at the same time and wants people to renounce emotion and be free from desire for pleasure or fear of pain through wisdom and rational actions. A few centuries later, Marcus Aurelius recorded his progress on transforming himself in becoming such a wise Stoic person. During the late 1300s, modern humanism specified that the meaning of life is to promote and support other humans as we should act in self-interest and the common good and take responsibility for humanity's destiny. This philosophy was followed by subjectivism in the early 1600s that sets out that the meaning of life is different for each person and depends on one's mental state and achieving personalized goals. This philosophy is ascribed to René Descartes and his thought experiment, I think, therefore, I exist. Liberalism, introduced by English philosopher John Locke, appeared in 1689 and states that the meaning of life is to defend individual liberties as a person should be free to make their own choices without the consent of others. The origin of Kantianism is German philosopher Immanuel Kant, which in 1785 proposed that every human action should be judged according to a universal principle that relate their duty towards humans. According to this philosophy, the meaning of life is to do as you would others do to follow universal principles. Nihilism or pessimism, which appeared in 1862, is the belief that as there seems to be an inherent human tendency that prevents us from finding meaning in life, nothing can make life really meaningful for us. The German philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche, who has been most associated with this philosophy, introduced the concept will to power and claimed that people should develop their own identity through self-realization without relying on anything transcending their lives. Pragmatism as a philosophy arrived in the 1870s and is more focused on pursuing a useful understanding of life as opposed to the truth of life. The American philosopher and psychologist William James reasoned that truth could be made but not sought and that the meaning of life depends on what you do with your life and maximize value to humanity. In the 1920s, the philosophy of logical positivism or logical empiricism indicates that the meaning of life can only be derived from a person's actual experience and what you give it, as the only type of knowledge available to us is scientifically verifiable and observable facts and anything else is meaningless. In the 1940s, the existentialism philosophy describes that to find meaning in life, a person needs to make choices about their own values and then take positive action to live according to them. In 1942, French philosopher Albert Camus proposed absurdism, that people should embrace the absurdity of our existence, stop trying to find meaning and just carry on with our lives. But what do everyday thoughtful 21st century people think about the meaning of life and what it is to be human? Of the many internet resources on this topic, the Excellence Reporter website, claiming to be the number one most meaningful website on earth, provides over 1,200 articles and interviews on what is the meaning of life, written by renowned spiritual leaders, mindful experts, great thinkers and authors, elders, artists, musicians, CEOs and many others. In a personal blog, Daniel Smachtenberger also highlights three components to living a meaningful life, which includes a mode of being that involves appreciating the beauty of existence, a mode of doing which adds to the beauty of existence, and a mode of becoming which increases your ability to appreciate and add to the beauty of existence. He sees that most of our actions come from one's being, which is strongly conditioned and influenced by past unconscious activities. Being then influences what a person is doing, whereas doing in turn conditions the person further. He reckons that doing affects how a person is changing and becoming, whereas becoming then changes the integrated state of a person's being. 
Daniel explains further that being, doing, and becoming are equally fundamental, inseparable, and interaffecting in a ring. The cycle can be vicious or virtuous. Everything that is meaningful is one of these three. Engaging in all three consciously as a virtuous cycle leads to a maximally meaningful life. All three are ultimately inspired by love. Lex Friedman has this habit of asking people on his podcast about the meaning of life. What follows next is the essence of a wide variety of meaningful responses to this question, paraphrased, which help to provide some further rich insights into how modern-day thoughtful people think about this. It is also interesting to see how they fit into Maslow's eight-stage hierarchical motivational model, as well as the schools of philosophies, classification framework of supernatural, subjective, objective, and no meaning. Noam Chomsky, a renowned linguist, philosopher, cognitive scientist, historian, social critic, and political activist, believes that there is no general answer to the meaning of life and that we determine what the meaning is. He thinks that the significance of your life is something you create, as the action determines the meaning in the sense of significance. Steven Pinker, a cognitive psychologist, linguist, and popular science author, thinks about the meaning of life as obtaining knowledge and fulfillment more generally with respect to life, health, stimulation, and access to the living cultural and social world. That is not the meaning of our genes, which is to propagate copies of themselves. Although this is also a subset of our meaning, we also want to interact with people. We want to experience beauty and experience the richness of the natural world. To understand what makes the universe tick is way up there for Stephen. He sees the latter as fundamental, what we strive for and what makes us homo sapiens, wise man. We are unique amongst animals to the degree in which we acquire and use knowledge to survive. We make tools, we strike agreements via language, we extract poisons, we predict the behavior of animals, we get to know the workings of plants, the refinement of reason in pursuit of human well-being, health, happiness, social richness, cultural richness, and using our intellect and our knowledge of how the world works to make discoveries and strike agreements to make us all better off in the long run. David Chalmers, a philosopher and cognitive scientist specializing in philosophy of mind, philosophy of language, and consciousness, reckons that without consciousness there is no meaning. He views consciousness as the source of meaning, but not the meaning itself. David believes that what is meaningful in life is what we find meaningful. If you find meaning and fulfillment in intellectual work like understanding, that is a significant part of the meaning of life for you. Other things that provide significant meaning include our social connections and raising a family. As meaning comes from what you value as a conscious creature, he does not think there is a universal answer to this question. In discussing neuroscience of optimal performance with Lex Friedman, Andrew Huberman, who is a neuroscientist at Stanford University, claims that our sense of meaning is very elastic in time and space. He also references Viktor Frankl and his book The Man's Search for Meaning and finds it amazing that someone locked in a cell or a concentration camp can bring in the horizon close enough so that they can micro-slice their environment in order to find rewards, meaning, power, and beauty, even in a little square box or a horrible situation. This speaks to one of the most important features of the human mind, which he illustrates with two opposite extremes. Let us say the alarm goes off in the building, and the building starts shaking. Our senses such as hearing and vision will be tuned to the space-time bubble for those moments and the only meaning would be centered around things like getting out of the building safely, trying to find out what is going on, and contact loved ones. If we now consider the other extreme, where we sit back completely relaxed and contemplate our place in the vast universe and see ourselves as one brief glimmer in all of time and all of space, it feels more meaningless and if we do not matter. It is beautiful that the human mind allows us to be so dynamic that we can pull meaning from the past, present, and the future. For people such as Viktor Frankl and Nelson Mandela, it was not just about grinding it out, but finding those dopamine rewards in their boxes that they were forced into. Andrew thinks that meaning is held for only as long as we are in that space-time regime. 
What really gives meaning is that one can move between these different space-time dimensionalities using different brain processing algorithms in a different state. Given this perspective, Andrew wants in his lifetime to engage into as many different levels of contractions and dilations of meaning as possible. He wants to go to the micro and the macro, as the journey up and down and back and forth, that staircase, is the key thing. He sees his goal as getting as many trips as possible up and down that staircase whilst he is still alive. Joron Brook, an objectivist philosopher, podcaster and author, believes that principles of a life well lived is to live a rational life with thought. He reckons that many people are not thinking things through and are like zombies. They are alive, but they are not really alive because their mind is not focused on what they need to do to live a great life. Too many people are just going through the motions of living without embracing life. Yaron thinks that the secret to living a great life is to take it seriously. This involves using our mind and reason, the one tool that makes us human and provides us with all the values that we have and applies it to living. If we use that same energy, focus and concentration that we apply to work and apply it also to actually live life in a principled way with well-chosen values that will change our lives as well as the world. As we only live once, this life is really valuable. Yoron is of the opinion that people in general do not have that deep respect for their own lives, time or mind. He thinks that experience is the easy part and not where the problem is. It is relatively easy for people to stop and appreciate the moment. The problem is that people are not using their mind with respect to planning their lives, thinking how to live and choosing what your values are. What is messing up the world is that people have the wrong values. They do not think about them and they do not have plans for their own lives. Joran states that reason as this massive evolutionary achievement and our only source of knowledge is undervalued. We have this capacity to self-program, but are not programmed to know how to hunt, to do agriculture, or to build computers and networks. All of that requires effort, focus, energy, will, and someone to choose to do it. When you make that choice, you are choosing to engage your reason in discovery, integration, and work to change the world in which we live. Human beings had to figure out how to do it. Ian Hutchinson, a nuclear engineer and plasma physicist at MIT, sees the meaning of his life as many different things, but all kind of centered around relationships. As a Christian, his relationship with God is a crucial part of the meaning of life. He also views his relationships with his wife, parents, children, siblings and grandchildren as crucially important. These are all the places that people find meaning if they are religious or not. But ultimately for Ian, a person who has faith in a creator, who we think has an intention and a will in respect to the world as a whole, that is a crucial part of meaning. And the idea that his life might have some small significance in the plan of that creator is an amazingly powerful idea that brings meaning. The predominantly secular view is that there is no meaning, but you can make up a meaning as you go that will give you meaning in your life. He does not subscribe to that view anymore. He thinks that there is more meaning than that, but agrees that those things that give meaning to life are important and we should emphasize them. Love and loyalty are about yielding your will and desire to another, valuing others at least as highly as yourself. With true love, you reach a point where you feel compelled by the other. It sounds scary, but it is liberating. Love brings you into service to one another. Ian states that for Christians to serve God is what perfects their freedom. Amazing love is in part captivity, but in a paradoxical sense, it is also an amazing freedom. David Fravor, an experienced U.S. Navy pilot and a primary witness in one of the most credible unidentified flying object sightings in history, reckons the meaning of life really boils down to what matters the most in life to you, which is your family and your closest friends. He relates the meaning of life also to his belief in God, as he has just seen too many things in the world that he cannot explain. Ray Dalio, 
a billionaire hedge fund manager and philanthropist and co-founder of the world's largest hedge fund, Bridgewater Associates, views evolution as the greatest force in the universe. He thinks that we are all tiny bits of an evolutionary type of process. It is just matter and machines that go through time. Ray believes that we all have a deeply embedded inclination to personally evolve and contribute to evolution. Michael Mina, an immunologist, epidemiologist and physician at Harvard who discussed rapid testing, viruses and the engineering mindset with Lex Friedman, thinks that there is no single answer to the meaning of life. From a Western perspective, this life is the most precious thing in the world as opposed to the Eastern perspective that regards it as just another opportunity to get out of life or being part of the cycle of suffering, which is very much part of human existence, on the way to Nirvana, after which one is not reborn again. For example, he sees a big disparity in the Judeo-Christian point of view of going to heaven versus the Buddhistic one of getting out of life as viewpoints that cannot really be reconciled. As Michael thinks that we are just a bunch of proteins and a blip on the radar, we should make the most of this amazing blink of time whilst we are here. Scott Aronson, a professor specializing in quantum computing at UT Austin, views the meaning of life as trying to discover new things about the world, sharing and communicating these things, and learning what other people have discovered. His family, friends, kids, students and people around him all contribute to the meaning of his life. Scott tries to make the world better in small ways and would love to do more. As the world is facing a crisis over climate, resurgent authoritarianism and other major concerns, he also tries to take a stand where possible against the things that he finds worrying. For Eugenia Kuda, co-founder of Replica, which is a developer of AI companion software, the meaning of life is the state of love when we feel it, that state of bliss that we sometimes experience in a connection and love with ourselves towards other people, to technology, and many other things in the world. Dan Kokotov, a VP of engineering at Rev.ai and focus on AI-driven speech recognition, sees the meaning of life as contributing to this weird thing that we call humanity in living life, creating things, and raising kids. For Grant Sanderson, the creator of 3 Blue 1 Brown math education channel on YouTube, the interactions with other people gives him joy. Sarah Seeger, a planetary scientist at MIT and known for her work on the search for exoplanets, does not have an answer to the meaning of life, but wishes we knew. For Dilip George, a brain-inspired AI researcher and co-founder of Vicarious, the meaning of life is open and about understanding the machinery of the world. Diana Walsh Pasulka, a professor of philosophy and religion at UNCW and author of American Cosmic, UFOs, Religion and Technology, reckons that we assume there is a meaning to life, but maybe there is not. She sees the meaning of life as something intrinsic. Sometimes she enjoys living and sometimes she does not. When she is not enjoying living, her strategy is to change her circumstances. Diana also believes that love of your children is intrinsic. It is beautiful. There is something about it that is intrinsically desirable. The meaning of life is intrinsically desirable. For Russ Tedrake, a roboticist and professor at MIT and vice president of robotics research at TRI, doing hard things is part of the meaning of life. For him, it is important to understand what you can and cannot do and love the journey of learning things that would help you to connect another piece of the puzzle. When asked about the meaning of life, Alex Filipenko, an astrophysicist and professor of astronomy at Berkeley, thinks that life is what you make of it and each of us have to have our own meaning. According to him, meaning is in some sense typically associated with goals or expectations for yourself the things that you would like to accomplish or that you would like to experience. The degree to which you do or experience those things can give you meaning. Alex believes that we do not have to change the world like Michelangelo or Da Vinci. We cannot claim that as most of the current close to 8 billion people on the planet are not changing the world on an individual level, that their lives are meaningless. 
For each person, it is just something specific that gives you meaning, satisfaction, and a good feeling about what you did. This could be helping others, getting knowledge and better understanding through study and reading, or experience the world through traveling. If socioeconomic factors constrain you, you can find other forms of meaning. It does not need to be something profound, such as changing the world, or be someone that everyone remembers. The brain is giving each one of us the potential for meaning. Alex hopes that we use science for good and not for evil and end up destroying ourselves. Dmitry Dolgov, the CTO of an autonomous vehicle company called Waymo, perceives the meaning of life as something that changes over time as you go through the stages of life. When one enters the world, meaning is about new experiences, then it is about fun then learning new things and experiencing the joy of comprehension and discovery. Then it is about giving back through impact and contribution that might touch society, people or technology. He sees having kids as something that changes one's perspective and adds to the meaning of life instead of having a replacing or subtracting effect. Matthew Johnson, a professor and psychedelics researcher at Johns Hopkins, think that the meaning of life is to find meaning and is like the transcendence of everything where you find the beauty despite the absolute ugliness that we also see. He reminds us that as a species we come from filth, that we are animals and all descendants of murderers and rapists. Despite that background, we are capable of this self-sacrifice, connecting with people, figuring things out such as truth, science and other forms of truth-seeking and able to generate artwork and appreciate the beauty of music and other forms of art. Just the fact that this is possible is the meaning of life. Matthew reckons that most of the important things in life are the things that are tough and scary. Although we try to minimize and avoid the biggest horror experiences on a societal, country or personal level, such as the death of loved ones, these are sometimes the greatest learning experiences and are instrumental in making who we are on all levels of civilization. He encourages us to give ourselves a break as humanity and see the meaning of life in choosing to focus on the positives and keeping them always in mind. When thinking of the meaning of life, Michael Littman, a computer scientist and AI researcher at Brown University, cannot help to also project himself into the world of the reinforcement learning AI agents with their small little lifetimes and look for analogies with real human life. He thinks the meaning of life is balance, whilst his wife thinks it is healthy relationships with people that you love and working hard for good causes. Michael Stevens, the host of the Vsauce podcast, thinks about the meaning of life from the perspective that we are learning things, recording things, and writing stories about the world. He believes that preserving these things is what the essence is about being human. He sees humanity as the best autobiographers of the universe. We are better than, for example, fossils or the light spectrum in this regard. As we are collecting much better detail about what is happening, he thinks that should be our legacy. For Michael, the measure of your life is based on your subjective experience. If you are happy and those that you love are happy, that should be enough. Manolis Killis, a professor at MIT and head of the MIT Computational Biology Group, mentions in his discussion with Lex Friedman about the human genome and evolutionary dynamics that he also thinks a lot about the meaning of life. Like a few others that are intrigued by the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy and its answer to the meaning of life, which is 42, he had a party with this theme on his 42nd birthday. In his symposium on the meaning of life, he had 42 of his colleagues and friends to also give their perspectives on this. He mentions that although everybody had a different answer, they were all consistent with one another and mutually synergistic and together formed a beautiful view of what it means to be human in many ways. Some of the participants talked about the loss of their loved ones, such as their life partner for many years, and how their lives changed through that. Some people talked about the origin of life, and some people talked about the difference between purpose and meaning. One memorable response was from a linguistics professor at Harvard that said that she would give a Pythian answer, 
In Greek mythology, a Pythian answer is a cryptic short answer that can be interpreted in many different ways. She said that the meaning of life is to become one. The first interpretation is that similar to a child, we should become a one-year-old with the excitement of discovering everything about the world. The second interpretation is that in all endeavors, become the first or the best in whatever you do, which means to give it your all and perform any task at the best of your abilities. The third interpretation is to become one when people are separate, implying that people should come together and learn to understand each other. Manolis has the opinion that the pursuit for meaning can very much be the meaning of life. This can be expressed as a continuous pursuit for something sublime, something human, something tangible, or some aspect of what defines us both as a species and as an individual person through my own life. The meaning of life can also be the meaning of all life. Manolis asks a range of questions in this regard. What is the point of life? Why life itself? We can think about the history and evolution of life, but what about life in the first place? Is life inevitable? Is life part of physics? Does life transcend physics? Life is fighting against entropy through grouping and increasing concentrations rather than diluting away. Is life a distinct entity in the universe beyond the simple basic traditional physical rules that govern gravity, electromagnetism, strong and weak forces? Is life another force? Is there a life force? Is there a unique set of principles that emerge and build on top of the hardware of physics? Is life a new layer of software or a new layer of computer system? Manolis also remarks that our species are special and probably the only ones that worry about the meaning of life. That is possibly another thing that makes us human. Other aspects include being passionate about interests and the work that you do. The ability to be useful and to feel my brain is being used also provides meaning. The meaning of life is also touched by gratitude. Manolis emphasizes that there is a certain pleasure that comes from being useful as well as grateful. He also teaches his children gratitude through a little prayer. Thank you God for all you have given me and give me the strength to give unto others with the same love that you have given to me. Children give tremendous meaning to one's life. Manolis expressed this meaning through sharing what it means to him to teach his children about his view of the world and watching through their eyes the naivety with which they start and the sophistication with which they end up. There is also a certain understanding that they develop of not only the natural world but of him too. There is also the unfiltered criticism that one gets from your own children that typically knows no bounds of honesty. Manolis reveals that he has grown components of his heart that he did not know he had until he had sensed that fragility and vulnerability of the children, that immense love and passion, the unfiltered egotism that we as adults hide so well, and the emotions that tell us of the raw material of a human being and how these raw materials can be rearranged with more sophistication as they learn through life to become truly human adults. He observes that there is something so beautiful about seeing the progression of his children, the complexity of the language growing as more neural connections are formed, and the realization that the brain's hardware is getting rearranged as the software is getting implemented on that hardware, and that their frontal cortex is continuing to grow for another 10 years as new neural connections being formed. Manolis thinks that it is incredible that instead of humans growing their brain's hardware for 30 years and then feeding it all the knowledge, the knowledge is fed continuously whilst neural connections are shaped as they form. He reckons that to see a child's transformation is one of the most beautiful things that one can do as a human being. It not only completes you as a person, but also that journey of creating life adding the human parts through decades of compassion, sharing, love, anger, impatience, and patience. He thinks that this whole experience as a parent has also helped him to become a different kind of teacher. Lex Friedman and Manolis Kellis took their discussion about the meaning of life to another level in the 142nd episode of Lex Podcast that has been dedicated to the meaning of life, the universe, and everything. Manolis asks, why do we search for meaning and will the search lead to our destruction? 
He's optimistic about human civilization and thinks that while science and technology are moving forward at breakneck speed, we will sort out our social and political problems. He emphasizes that asking about meaning is something inherent to human nature that makes it beautiful and worth living and that searching for meaning is actually the point. He goes further by stating that we should not find the meaning of life and if we find it, we are dead. We should not ever be satisfied that we've got it as life is lived forward but only makes sense when we look backward. He sees the whole search itself as the meaning of life. There are in fact two simultaneous searches going on, where the one is a search in each of us through our own lives to find the meaning, and the other one the search for the meaning of humanity itself. We as humans like to look at animals and say, of course they have a meaning on a certain level, such as a dog with its bunch of instincts running around loving everything. In line with Maslow's needs hierarchy for us humans, life is not just about the physiological and safety needs with respect to procreation, dominance, strength or feeding, but also making use of our substantial cognitive capability to that we can use for so many other things as we pursue our psychological, cognitive, aesthetic, self-fulfillment and self-actualization needs. Eric Brynjolfsson, an economist at Stanford, has the opinion that real happiness is not coming from pleasure-seeking or hedonism and that one needs to do something beyond this. He thinks that we need to find other goals and meaning in life which will ultimately make you happier. Eric uses the analogy of happiness being like a dim star. If you do not look at it directly and focus on the area around it, your retina does a better job of picking up the star. In the same way, we should not be focusing directly on happiness, but on goals and meaning that might lead to that. Eric finds meaning in the kind of research he does where he contributes to help making the world a better place. As we are social beings with brains that are not only wired for pleasure, we also have a strong inclination to help others, which is deeply rooted in our psyche. If we feel like we are helping others, our reward system kicks in and we are more deeply satisfied compared to just doing something selfish and shallow. When asked about the meaning of life in a discussion about the future of computing and programming languages, Chris Latner, a software and hardware engineer that have led projects at Apple, Tesla, Google and Sci-5, responded by saying that he is prepared for it to not mean anything but prefers to say that the universe has a lot of value. Although we are biological things programmed to survive and propagate our DNA, he does not regard that thinking to be a productive way to live your life. Chris finds his happiness through the relationships he builds with other people and having kids. The question that he asks himself is what he can do that has value and help to move the world forward. He likes to take what he is good at, focus on things he can do in a domain that matters, work hard and bring it into the world. Chris loves innovation and creating breakthrough moments and gets excited to create value that other people can build on to help move the world forward. Lisa Feltman Barrett, a neuroscientist, psychologist and author, believes there are many meanings of life which can even be different ones on different days. The meaning of life is a population of instances she feels that sometimes the meaning of life for her is to understand and to make meaning. Sometimes it is to leave the world slightly a bit better. Sometimes it is to clear the path for her children or students. And sometimes it is just getting immersed in the moment of experiencing the wonder about the physical world, the sunset, the sky or life. Michael Malice, a political thinker, podcaster and author, sees the meaning of life as this wonderful opportunity to do something amazing. He illustrates this by saying that life is like going to a countryside and seeing a blank canvas on an easel. One kind of mentality is being annoyed by the blank canvas and complains about it, whereas the other type sees it as a great opportunity within this beautiful setting to have the entire canvas to paint without any constraints. Michael sees himself as the second type of person. When you are young, you think life is like driving a car, but then you start realizing that living life is more like a surfer, where you only control this little board and you have no idea where the waves will take you. Sometimes you are going to fall down and swallow some salt water, but at a certain point you are going to stop trying to drive and say this is awesome, 
Even if you have no idea where it is going to go, Joe Rogan, a comedian, ultimate fighting championship commentator, and the host of the Joe Rogan Experience, mentioned to Lex Friedman that there are many meanings of life and that life can be navigated to be enjoyable. One of the key things it requires is love, which means that you need to have loved ones, family, and friends. He thinks that it is of primary importance to have people that care about you and you have to care about them. Then it also requires interests and things that stimulate you and that you are passionate about. Joe reckons that there are far too many people that are sucked into just doing a job, putting in their time and then going home but not having a passion for what they are doing. He thinks that this is a recipe for a boring and unfulfilling life. He also mentions that even people with just a subsistent lifestyle that believe and practice this lifestyle of living off the land through hunting, fishing and living in the woods to also seem very happy. As there is a direct connection between their actions and their sustenance, they are connected to nature which is very satisfying for them. Joe is also interested in helping people and likes to make them feel good and do things that show he cares about them. He wants his family and friends to feel good. He likes to spread positive energy, joy and happiness and relay all the things that he has learned and good advice that he has been given. He is happy if that can benefit people and improve the quality of their life and their success or relationships. That means a lot to him. Joe also stresses the importance of the way we interact with one another. If people upset you or there is a negative energy coming to you from individuals or groups of people, you feel it and it has an impact on your psyche wellness and physical being. The more you receive and spread love, the more you create this butterfly effect spreading outward in treating people better with kindness and generosity. You might be extremely successful in your job, but still be in a position where everybody hates you, which causes you in turn to be miserable, alone, angry, depressed and sad. Joe mentions that if you hear about rich and famous people that commit suicide, he thinks that they have missed the mark and have put too many eggs in one basket, say the financial basket, the success basket, or the accomplishment basket, and not enough in the friendship and love basket. To be happy, there needs to be a balance in how you organize your buckets in life. For Francois Cholet, an AI researcher at Google, one of the answers to the meaning of life starts with understanding that everything that makes up who we are, even your most personal thoughts, are not your own. Our understanding is expressed in words we did not invent, built on concepts and images that you did not invent. We are very much cultural beings, which makes us different to animals. He thinks that everything about us is an echo of the past, an echo of people that lived before us. Similarly, if we manage to contribute something to culture, which can be a new idea, a beautiful piece of music or art, a grand theory or new words, that will also become a part of culture and contribute to future humans for as long as our species exist. Francia has the opinion that everything we do creates ripples into the future and is effectively in a way our path to immortality. As we contribute things to culture, Culture in turn becomes future humans and we keep influencing people thousands of years from now. Our actions today create ripples. These ripples sum up the meaning of life in the same way we are the sum of the many different ripples that came from our past. We should be kind to others during our time on earth because every act of kindness causes ripples and in reverse every act of violence also creates ripples. That is why one needs to carefully choose which kind of ripples you want to create and propagate into the future. When considering the meaning of life, Sheldon Solomon, a social psychologist, a philosopher, co-developer of terror management theory and co-author of The Worm at the Core, believes the first responsibility is to take care of yourself and then to take care of other people. For him to be kind and decent is paramount and to see these qualities in his children means a lot to him. Sheldon thinks that although education is tremendously important, intelligence is vastly overrated. He would like to be known as somebody that takes himself too seriously to take himself too seriously and to leave the world a slightly better place or at least do no harm. For Sergey Levine, a professor at Berkeley and an AI researcher in deep learning, reinforcement learning, robotics and computer vision, 
One thing that does give meaning, or at least some degree of satisfaction, is to work on a problem that really matters. It is less important to actually solve the problem, but quite nice to spend time on things that he believes really matter. He tries very hard to look for that. Sergey would love to build a machine that can run up against the ceiling of the complexity of the universe. David Patterson, a Turing Award winner and professor of computer science at Berkeley, values relationships with people, which includes those that you work with, that you influence, and that you can help. He thinks that those things that affect people are more important than all the work-related stuff that is more transitory. AI researcher Ben Goodsell thinks that the meaning of life boils down to three basic values, which are joy, growth, and choice. He sees joy as the basis of everything and is unsatisfied with joy that is static and does not progress. So we need growth. Ben also likes the idea of individuality, where a person has some agency and can make choices. According to him, for humans to get the most joy, growth and choice, we should go beyond the current human form and follow the transhumanism route. He reckons that as joy, growth and choice cannot be maximized in our human bodies, other configurations of matter can manifest even greater amounts of joy, growth and choice than humans do. Maybe even find ways of going beyond the realm of matter as we understand it right now. From a practical perspective, Ben has the opinion that much of the meaning of life is to create something better than humans and go beyond human life. That said, the meaning of life for him is also to enjoy everyday human social existence with his kids, grandchildren, parents, family and many friends. Enjoying nature and the pleasant moments are all part of the meaning of life. He just feels that the growth and choice aspects are severely limited by our human biology. In particular, the fact that we die inhibits our potential for personal growth considerably. In discussing artificial consciousness and the nature of reality with Lex Friedman, Joshua Bach, who is the VP of Research at the AF Foundation and previously a researcher at MIT and Harvard, thinks that happiness is a cookie that your brain bakes for itself. He believes that happiness is not made by the environment and that the environment cannot make you happy. It is your appraisal of the environment that makes you happy. If you can change your appraisal of the environment, which is something that one can learn to do, you can create arbitrary states of happiness. He observes that some meditators fall into this trap. They discover the basement room in their minds where the cookies are made and they indulge in stuff themselves and after a few months it gets really old and then the big crisis of meaning comes. Because they thought that the result of their unhappiness was that they were not happy enough, they try to fix this by training their brain to release the neurotransmitters at will and then the crisis of meaning pops up at a deeper layer. However, according to him, the problem that we could not solve in the first place is how I can live, how I can make a sustainable civilization that is meaningful to me and how I can insert myself into this. In addressing the meaning of life, Joshua recommends that we look at what the cell is. Life is the cell, which is the organizing thing that can participate in evolution. In order to make the cell work as a molecular machine, it needs a self-replicator that produces copies of itself, a negative entropy extractor that feeds on free energy at constant temperature and pressure to help life decrease or keep constant its entropy, and a Turing machine that can simulate an algorithm's logic. If any of these parts are missing, you don't have a cell, and the thing is not living. Joshua describes life as basically the emerging complexity over this principle. Once you have this intelligent super molecule, the cell, there is very little that you cannot make it do. He thinks it is probably the optimal computer for a human, especially in terms of resilience. The cell's durability is demonstrated through how difficult it would be to sterilize the earth once it has been infected with life. Joshua sees us humans as just an expression of the cell at a certain level of complexity in the organization of cells. In a way, it is tempting to think of the cell as a von Neumann probe, a spacecraft capable of replicating itself. He thinks that one of the best possible ways to build intelligence on another planet is to infect it with cells and wait long enough to give it a reasonable chance to evolve into an information processing principle that is general enough to become sentient. 
It is interesting to note that biological systems are designed from the inside out as opposed to technical design that works from the outside inwards. With life, seed becomes a seedling by taking some of the relatively unorganized matter around it and turning it into its own structure, thereby subduing the environment. Cells can cooperate if they can rely on other cells that have a similar organization that is already compatible. But unless it is there, the cell needs to divide to create that structure by itself. It is a self-organizing principle that works on a somewhat chaotic environment and the purpose of life in this sense is to produce complexity. He sees complexity as allowing you to harvest negative entropy gradients that you could not harvest without the complexity. In this sense, intelligence and life are very strongly connected because the purpose of intelligence is to allow control under the conditions of complexity. So, life is effectively shifting the boundaries between the ordered systems into the realm of chaos. As this is what life is doing, Joshua believes that there is not necessarily a deeper meaning. The only meaning is that which we have priors for and reward for. He reckons that outside the priors there is no meaning and that meaning only exists if a mind projects it. That is probably civilization. What feels most meaningful to Joshua is to try and build and maintain a sustainable civilization as this is the higher being that we are part of. It is the thing that we have a similar relationship as the cell to our body. We have this prior because we have evolved to organize in these structures. He sees the Christian God in its natural form as a platonic form of civilization where you ideally interact with others, not based on your incentives, but what you think is right. In Lex Friedman's discussion with renowned neuroscientist Carl Friston about neuroscience and the free energy principle, Carl uses this principle to help contextualize his answer for the meaning of life. As the states of a system can typically be described by internal and external states that are separated by sensory and active states, the free energy principle says that living or non-living systems minimize a free energy function of their internal states which requires beliefs about external states in their environment. When applied to action and perception in the human brain, where the active and internal states minimize a free energy function of sensory states, the result is internal brain states that correspond to perception, whereas the active states or actions are linking internal brain states to external states of the environment. The human brain system can thus be seen to act as an inference engine that continuously corrects its model of the world through maximizing model evidence or minimizing the difference, which can be described as surprise, between its model of the world and its sense and associated perception. Human brain systems can also minimize the free energy of the system by actively changing the world into the expected state that it is modeling. Considering the meaning of life from this perspective, Call indicates that we are searching for information and resolving uncertainty about the kind of thing that we are. Each one of us has certain beliefs about the kind of creature or person you are. All that self-evidencing or minimizing free energy in an active and embodied way means that you are fulfilling the beliefs about what kind of thing you are. He mentions that we are all given those scripts or narratives at a very early age usually initially in the form of bedtime or fairy tale stories that has been incultured by your immediate family and the culture that you grow up with and that you also create for yourself through active inference and self-evidencing. Carl states that not only is each one of us modeling our own environment, conditioning and external states out there, but we are actively changing them all the time. There is also a synchronistic occurrence as we are not only doing this back to ourselves, but also together as a civilization, which means that each one of us is creating our own culture at different timescales. Dawn Song, a professor of computer science at UC Berkeley, has considered many external factors and voices as well as internal views on the meaning of life and concludes that each one of us needs to find our own meaning in life. She mentions that you have the freedom to define it. Dawn also asks, what does it really mean and does the question make sense? She thinks that meaning can be deeper or shallower than just happiness. Most people are not thinking about this question and the meaning of life does not matter to them that much. 
It is an open question if knowing the meaning of life is helping your life to be better or you to be happier. As life is a collection of moments, some people just want to experience life to the fullest and fill those moments with the richest possible experiences. Dawn recommends that separate from just experiences, we should try to grow every day and try to be a better self within an evolving civilization. Ilya Sutskiver, a deep learning expert and co-founder of OpenAI, feels that it is amazing that we exist and that we should try to make the most of it and maximize our own value and enjoyment whilst reducing our suffering during the very short time that we have available. Human wants things, and our wants are our individual objective functions which we can update. Although there is an evolutionary objective function, which is to procreate and let your children succeed, our individual happiness comes from the way you look at things, define and drive our individual objective functions. For Daphne Collar, a professor of computer science at Stanford University, we should use our lives to leave the world a better place, and even more so when you are in a privileged position to impact and give back. For Jack Dorsey, the CEO of Twitter and Square, the meaning of life consists of many things, which include being aware of just being alive, having a connection with people, having long-lasting friendships and families meaningful, and seeing things that he has helped to build that other people use are meaningful and powerful. In Jack's mind, it ultimately comes down to a sense of connection, a realization that I'm part of a thing that is bigger than myself and feeling it directly in small ways or large ways. He reckons that humanity has taken too long to realize our connectedness and that we have been hiding our connectivity in various ways, but we should now change that. Dimitri Korkin, a professor of bioinformatics and computational biology at Worcester Polytechnic Institute, hopes that what he and other scientists do are useful and states that human life is fragile and that we need to bond together as a society. In addressing this question, Stephen Wolfram, CEO at Wolfram Research, explains that he does things that he finds fulfilling to do and that he cannot justify everything he does based on a broader context of the meaning of life. Some things that he finds fulfilling are small, whereas others are bigger in nature. It also varies during stages of life. Things that he was not interested in earlier on in life are now interesting. In terms of justifying things in some larger global sense, he can describe why it might be important in the world, but his local reason for doing it is that he finds it personally fulfilling. Stephen concludes that he cannot find a ground truth for his life or for civilization. Richard Dawkins, an evolutionary biologist, believes that from a scientific perspective, the meaning of life is the propagation of DNA. But from a personal point of view, that is not what he feels is the meaning of his life. He thinks that we each make our own meaning. We set up goals that we want to achieve by our brains that have got goal-seeking machinery built into them. These higher level goals can be noble goals or even spiritual goals, which are very different to the biological goals of propagating DNA. David Silver, who leads the Reinforcement Learning Research Group at DeepMind, believes that the meaning of life is multifaceted and can be viewed from many perspectives and layers. If we start by asking if the universe has a purpose, it looks like on one level it just follows certain mechanical laws of physics and that leads to the development of the universe. But on another level, you can view it through the lens of the second law of thermodynamics that says that the universe is increasing in entropy forever and that the goal of the universe is to maximize entropy. So, there are multiple levels that you can understand the system. On another level, if the goal is to maximize entropy, how can it be done by a particular system? Evolution is maybe something that the universe discovered in order to dissipate energy as efficiently as possible. But if you can think of evolution as a method for dispersing energy in the universe, then evolution becomes a goal. What is evolution then? It's got its own goal, which is to reproduce as effectively as possible. You need entities within the evolutionary process that can survive and reproduce as effectively as possible. So, it is natural that in order to achieve that higher level goal, those individual organisms discover brains or intelligence that enable them to support the goals of evolution. And those brains? What do they do? Perhaps the early brains were controlling some things at a direct level, 
may be the equivalent of pre-programmed systems that was controlling what was going on and setting certain things in order to achieve these particular goals. That led to another level of discovery, which was learning systems or brains being able to learn for themselves and learn how to program themselves to achieve any goal. Presumably, there are parts of the brain where goals are set to parts of that system and provides this very flexible notion of intelligence that we as humans presumably have, which is the ability to achieve any goal that we think possible to achieve. David considers this as a long way to say that there are many perspectives and many levels in which meaning, goals and intelligence can be understood. On each of those levels, you can have multiple perspectives. You can view the system as optimizing for a goal, understand it at a level we can maybe understand it and implement it from an AI perspective, or you can understand it on a level of a mechanistic perspective. These perspectives are not in contrast with one another, and the outcome of that system is not in contradiction with the fact that it is also a decision-making system that is optimizing for some goal and purpose. At the next level, we can ask how learning brains can achieve their goals more effectively. This can be achieved by us as learning beings, building systems that can solve our goals more effectively than we can. A new layer has been created by having systems that can create goals for themselves. Ultimately, there may be layers beyond where they set sub-goals to parts of their own system in order to achieve those goals, and so on. As David indicates, the story of meaning and intelligence can indeed be one of many perspectives and layers. Simon Sinek, an author of books such as Start With Why, Leaders Eat Last, and The Infinite Game, addresses the meaning of life as an infinite game. He starts out referencing James Carr's finite and infinite games, a vision of life as play and possibility that ascribes two kinds of games, where the one could be called finite, the other infinite. A finite game is played for the purpose of winning, an infinite game for the purpose of continuing the play. It will come to an end when someone has won. This has also challenged the viewpoints of Simon and others about how the world works. We all think about winning being the best and number one. That can only happen in a finite game with fixed rules and objectives and known players. There is a beginning, middle and an end and there have to be losers. Infinite games have known and unknown players. Anyone can join. It has changeable rules. You can play how you want. The objective is to perpetuate the game. Stay in the games as long as possible. There is no such thing as a winner or being number one. There is no finish line. When we try to win in a game with no finish line, we are trying to be the best in a game with no agreed upon objectives, metrics or time frames. There are a few consistent and predictable outcomes. The decline in trust, cooperation and innovation. Many of the ways we run our organizations is with a finite mindset. If you think about our tombstones, they have the date that you were born and the date when you died. But really, it is about what you do with the dash, the time in between. There is a poem by Linda Ellis called The Dash that starts with, I read of a man who stood to speak at the funeral of a friend. He referred to the dates on her tombstone from the beginning to the end. He noted that first came the date of her birth and spoke of the following date with tears. But he said what mattered most of all was the dash between those years. What gives our lives meaning is what we do with the dash. If we live our life with a finite mindset, which means to accumulate more money and power than anyone else, to outdo everyone else, to be number one, to be the best, we do not take any of this with us. We just die. The people get remembered the way we are remembered is what kind of people we were. Devoted mother, loving father, the person we were to other people. Do we want to be remembered for our contributions or detractions? The legacy that most of us would like to have is to live a life of service, see those around us rise, to contribute to our communities, to our organizations, to leave them in better shape than we found them. In the infinite game, one can be driven by a cause, purpose or vision that is bigger than oneself and where one's work ethic contributes to something larger than oneself. That is what drives Simon every day. 
He says that he wakes up every morning with a vision of a world that does not yet exist, where the vast majority of people in the world wake up every morning feeling inspired, feel safe at work, and feel fulfilled at the end of the day. Simon is driven by the fact that this is not the world we live in and that we still have work to do. As he knows what his underlying values are, Simon wakes to inspire people to do the things that inspire them. These are his go-tos or touch points. It inspires him to keep working. He thinks of a career as like an iceberg. If you have a vision for something, you are the only one that can see the iceberg underneath the ocean. If you start working at it, a little bit shows up and now a few other people can start to see what you are imagining and are then willing to help you. Then you start seeing a bigger part of the iceberg and people say you have accomplished so much but what he sees is all the work that still needs to be done. Simon still sees the huge iceberg underneath the ocean. What drives him is bringing more of the iceberg from the unknown to the known, bringing more of the vision from the imagination to reality.